Uh, and I want to first say the global cold war, that phrase um, has been used by uh, more and more historians over the last 15 to 20 years, instead of just saying cold war, to say global cold war as a way of trying to show that the cold war was really more than just a uh, east versus west superpower conflict. Uh, in fact, it was often it often took the form of the global north, namely the United States, carrying out imperialistic uh, intrusions into the global south, into Latin America, Asia, Africa, um, in the name of battling communism. Anti-communism was a really important theme in all of this, uh, as you'll see. Um, but th these kinds of intrusions I'm talking about often took the form of trying to undermine progressive or left-wing democratically elected governments or orchestrating or supporting coup d'etat and overthrows, um, supporting, bolstering right-wing military dictatorships, often murderous dictatorships, I should say, um, sometimes fueling proxy wars or directly engaging in wars like in Vietnam. So, so that's what global Cold War is trying to get at, that, that phrase. And I want to start in 1945, which was the year that World War II ended. And the United States and Soviet Union, Soviet Union being, you know, a communist country, um, were allies during World War II. So the Cold War didn't begin immediately when the war ended. It, it took a couple of years for that wartime alliance to kind of break down and for uh, a confrontation to take shape between the US and Soviet Union. So in 1945, where I'm starting, the AFL and CIO were still separate entities. Um, and just, this is somewhat simplistic, but in the interest of time, I'll just keep it simple. Uh, the AFL, that's the American Federation of Labor, uh, was founded in 1886 at a time when the labor movement was populated by revolutionaries and radicals and people wanting dramatic uh, social transformation. And AFL leaders kind of saw themselves as, well, just promoting pure and simple trade unionism, as they called it, not trying to uh, push the boundaries of uh, social change, or not trying to change the system or overthrow capitalism. They saw themselves as a non-radical kind of uh, trade union movement. So in that sense, the AFL was sort of prone towards anti-communism right from the beginning, but especially in the 1920s when um, trade unionists in the United States who were affiliated with the Communist Party USA were trying to organize within the AFL and its affiliated unions and central labor councils, trying to bring a more kind of class conscious orientation to the AFL, trying to pull it leftward politically, calling on craft unions, which was the AFL's model of uh, craft unionism, calling on them to amalgamate and form industrial unions so that unions would have more power wall to wall in specific industries. And this led to uh, the, you know, obviously AFL leaders didn't like the idea of, of communists trying to pull the AFL leftward. So there were a lot of bitter um, factional fights within the AFL in the 1920s that ultimately ended with communists, you know, being expelled or pushed out or, or leaving the AFL and trying to organize elsewhere. Um, but that that would play an important role later on during the Cold War in that a lot of AFL officials um, had had these very personal struggles or, or conflicts within their within the within organized labor uh, with the Communist Party USA. And then the CIO was formed. It's the Congress of Industrial Organizations formed in 1935 as a kind of breakaway from the AFL focused on not on you know, getting away from the craft unionism towards industrial unionism, trying to rapidly organize the mass production industries of the time, like the auto industry and the steel industry, taking advantage of New Deal laws that were being passed, like the National Labor Relations Act in the 1930s, and with a very progressive vision. And importantly, the CIO welcomed in communist trade unionists because they were dedicated, effective organizers. Um, and many unions within the CIO wound up being led by communists. And I, I just want to stress that these were democratically run unions, that the members were electing uh, communists to union, to union leadership positions, um, even if the rank and, file, rank and file themselves weren't necessarily communists or leftists, they recognized that these unionists were uh, 
um, we're fighting for them, fighting for good, strong contracts and, and, and other things like that. And also then during World War II, the Soviet Union and US were allies. So having you know communists be part of the labor movement wasn't particularly uh, at, or not as controversial when the US and Soviet Union were allies. During the war, uh, both the AFL and CIO were working closely with the US government um, in the war effort in various federal agencies. And um, the US government kind of rewarded the AFL and CIO by um, passing laws or, or having measures in place to, to make sure all the new jobs being created for the war effort, all the new industrial jobs for the for you know war production would be union jobs and that the workers in those positions would become union members. So union membership grew to rapid height, you know, extraordinary heights during World War II. And a, a lesson that some AFL and CIO officials learned from this was that supporting US foreign policy um, and demonstrating patriotism, you know, and that kind of thing could lead to uh, union growth. And, and, and that, that was something that they tried to continue with the Cold War. So when World War II ended, like I said, the, the Cold War didn't begin immediately, but the AFL, because it already had this tradition of anti-communism, was very eager to, to confront communists both at home and abroad and to kind of delegitimize communists, especially in the labor movement. Um, and the CIO, over a, a few years in the late 40s, kind of gradually turned more anti-communist as the political environment shifted in the United States. As, you have, as there was um, McCarthyistic um, witch hunts and hysteria and, and all of that, um, eventually the CIO expelled about 11 of its communist-led or leftist-led unions and, um, and raided them. And um, that includes... Uh, United Electrical Workers, um, although the UE uh, left of its own accord, uh, but after the CIO was already pushing to, to expel the, the UE. This was also a part of the context here of the 1947 Taft-Hartley Act, which among many other provisions included one that said union officials had to sign affidavits saying that they were not communists and had never been a member of the Communist Party. Um, and some union officials refused to sign that. So the CIA, CIO, <laughs> We'll get to the CIA. The CIO pushed them out. Um, so that's just a little bit of this background. And um, still starting in 1945, uh, the AFL, or actually 1944, before World War II was even over, the AFL created a new international arm called the Free Trade Union Committee. And this, this isn't about free trade, you know, like NAFTA or something like that. It, it's just, it's the word trade union, the phrase trade union with the word free just kind of stuck on, onto it. Uh, it's kind of a, an, a euphemism for anti-communist trade unionism. And the idea of the free, free trade unionism was to be, like I said, an international arm for the AFL to try to divide labor movements, especially in Europe where, um, were, that were communists were prominent in, in unions. And there are three key figures within the Free Trade Union Committee that I wanna talk about. Uh, first, George Meany, who was a plumber from the Bronx. Um, at this time, around 1944, 45, he was the secretary treasurer of the AFL. But later in 1951, he became president of the AFL and then later in 1955, became president of the AFL-CIO and remained in that position all the way until his retirement in 1979. So kind of the most important, I would say, or, or at least most powerful uh, labor official in the US for much of the mid to late 20th century. But he was part of this, this Free Trade Union Committee. The most important figure on, on the Free Trade Union Committee was Jay Lovestone. Um, who's sort of one of the most fascinating and unsavory characters in U.S. labor history. Um, Lovestone, in his youth, was uh, a leading member of the Communist Party USA, and in fact, in the late 1920s, had been the executive secretary of the Communist Party USA, but wound up being expelled from the party 
uh, by Joseph Stalin himself over various doctrinal differences and factional uh, conflicts. For a while in the 1930s, he continued, um, he started his own communist opposition party, still a communist party, but opposed to the, uh, the mainstream communist party. And the members of that were called Lovestoneites, uh, his followers. Finally, in 1940, he rejected communism and, and radical politics altogether and became an arch anti-communist. And so he was brought on board to, to head up the Free Trade Union Committee because of his intimate knowledge of world communism, of, of leftist politicians and, and labor leaders around the world from all of his experience. Um, I'll say more about him later. And then the, so, so Lovestone was running the Free Trade Union Committee from an office in New York. Um, the person out in the that they were sending out as a field representative was Irving Brown, this guy who uh, was a Lovestoneite, a follower of Lovestones in the 30s. And he was sent initially in 19, November of 1945, the AFL's Free Trade Union Committee sent him to Paris, France, to scope out the labor scene there. And what Brown found there in France, and, and as well as in Italy and other countries in Western Europe, was that the communist parties in those countries were very popular with the working class because they had been at the center of the anti-fascist, anti-Nazi resistance during World War II. And the, the labor federations and you know, labor confederations there in Western Europe had uh, a lot of communists in uh, leadership positions, including in France, the French uh, Confederation, General Confederation of Labor, which was sort of France's version of the AFL, uh, had was led by communists who had been, you know, democratically elected to those positions by the by rank and file unionists. And Brown's job on behalf of the Free Trade Union Committee was to try to sow discord within the French CGT, the General Confederation of Labor, by um, trying to drive a wedge between the non-communists and the communists. And uh, eventually around 1947, there was a split where uh, a group of anti-communist union leaders, leaders of like white collar civil service unions broke away from the CGT and formed their own separate labor federation called Force Ouvrier that Brown kind of uh, helped to engineer that. And, um, he did similar things in other countries. So it was all about trying to divide labor unions and, and labor movements along these Cold War battle lines between are you with the United States or are you more communist and more sympathetic to the Soviet Union and just driving a lot of labor disunity. So in 1947, the CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, was established uh, by Washington with the goal of you know, stopping the spread of communism and using covert methods and sometimes violent methods um, to uh, subvert communist political movements as well as communist-led labor movements. So the CIA was impressed with by what the AFL's Free Trade Union Committee was already doing and had been doing for the previous few years. And so in 1948, at the end of the year, the CIA and Free Trade Union Committee entered into a covert partnership where basically the CIA would give the Free Trade Union Committee money, and in exchange, the Free Trade Union Committee would give the CIA intelligence about foreign labor movements. Um, the actual agreement, it was a, there was a written agreement between the CIA and Free Trade Union Committee, and I'm going to quote from it about what the mission of this partnership was. It was, quote, to attack and break down communist control of labor groups and unions wherever it exists, to frustrate communist designs to obtain control over labor movements and to develop and advance free trade unionism, especially in areas subject to or potentially subject to communist influence. And the agreement also specified that both parties would deny the partnership existed at all because it was obviously it was covert. Um, so the CIA first started funding the Free Trade Union Committee in early 1949. And at this point, Irving Brown, the guy who was in Paris, you know, dividing the French labor movement, was reputed to be carrying around suitcases full of money because now the Free Trade Union Committee had lots of cash on hand from the CIA to basically bribe union officials into, um, into being more pro-US, pro-AFL, uh, 
and moving away from leftist-led or communist-led union or labor movements. And this, this funding from the CIA allowed the Free Trade Union Committee to expand uh, beyond Europe to, to Asia, into Japan, uh, Indonesia, India, doing the same kinds of things of trying to divide labor movements. But particularly noteworthy to me is what the Free Trade Union Committee was doing in China. Um, so in October 1949 was the Chinese Revolution where the Mao Zedong and the Communist Party in, uh, came to power in China. And the anti-communist forces, the Kuomintang, um, you know, left mainland China and went to Taiwan. The CIA um, wanted to try to undermine or subvert or sabotage uh, everything that was going on in mainland China. And so the CIA uh, gave the, the AFL's Free Trade Union Committee um, $145,000 in 1950, which is $1.8 million in today's money to do, to do that, to try to subvert uh, things in China. So what happened was the Free Trade Union Committee, again, which is part of the AFL, uh, using the CIA money created an organization in Taiwan called the Free China Labor League. And the idea uh, ostensibly was that the Free China Labor League was to be kind of an educational and informational program uh, for anti-communist Chinese union officials in Taiwan to you know, talk about the, the evils of communism in mainland China. And this is a, actually a secret document, or it's labeled secret that I found, not so secret anymore, that I found in, uh, in the archives. And um, you can see the part I highlighted, part of the mission of this Free China Labor League was to dispatch capable comrades to communist occupied territories, meaning mainland China, to participate in underground subversive activities. And then this is from that same document, the part I highlighted at the bottom. So they, they would be training people to do this. Special attention will be paid to the techniques of group organization, espionage, sabotage, dissemination of information. So in other words, the this Free China Labor League, which was officially a program of the AFL's Free Trade Union Committee, but was unofficially funded by the CIA, um, would be training people, uh, anti-communist, you know, Chinese people to from Taiwan to secretly go to mainland China and carry out espionage and sabotage. They were given guns, explosives, and radios. Um, and it's not, you know, it's a little bit sketchy about what they all got up to, but at least one of these Free China Labor League sabotage teams went to Shanghai and blew up storage tanks of aviation fuel, which led to this massive fire that uh, reportedly killed numerous civilians. Another team was sent to infiltrate a state-run textile mill and stir up unrest. Another team attempted to start a movement against the government's campaign to conscript soldiers to fight in the Korean War, um, and many other things like this. Um, but I point to, to the, this is kind of the most extreme example, but uh, it's you know all of this was overseen by Jay Lovestone on behalf of the AFL, and it demonstrates how far the AFL strayed from its you know supposed pure and simple trade unionism, where it's actually funding uh, what some people could describe as terrorism in a foreign country. In 1955, the AFL and CIO merged. Uh, that's a picture of the AFL president, George Meany, who again was part of the Free Trade Union Committee. And then Walter Ruther, president of the CIO and also president of the United Auto Workers. Ruther had been one of the people who led the charge in those anti-communist uh, expulsions in the late 40s in the CIO. So this is the birth of the AFL-CIO with George Meany as president. Part of the merger agreement between Meany and Ruther was for the Free Trade Union Committee to actually be shut down. Part of this had to do with the fact that Ruther hated Jay Lovestone. They had a they had a personal they had a history going back roughly twenty years and didn't like each other. And also, Ruther believed that U.S. labor should carry out its foreign policy um, in line with the social democratic trade unions of Western Europe. 
as opposed to doing its own unilateral thing. He wanted the AFL-CIO to be carrying out a more multilateral kind of foreign policy. So the CIA then, with the Free Trade Union Committee no longer existing, the CIA started to form partnerships with some AFL-CIO affiliated unions around 1958, including AFSME, the American Newspaper Guild, which is today the News Guild, uh, the Retail Clerks International Union, which later merged with other unions to become UFCW, and the Oil, Chemical, and Atomic Workers Union, which later merged into the Steel Workers. And I'll say more about that, but all of those unions had like an international affairs department, which was secretly being funded by the CIA. In 1959, the Cuban Revolution happened, and you know, Fidel Castro and the communists came to power in Cuba, and many in the United States foreign policy establishment, as well as the top officials in the AFL-CIO, were concerned that communism was going to spread across Latin America. And so, you know, President John F. Kennedy initiated the Alliance for Progress, this program to give $20 billion in economic aid over the course of 10 years to anti-communist governments in Latin America to try to prevent another Cuban revolution from happening. And what the AFL-CIO did in response to the Cuban revolution was create a new uh, international arm. You know, the Free Trade Union Committee no longer existed. So now the AFL-CIO created the American Institute for Free Labor Development or AFIELD as it was often called. Uh, formed in 1961, but it, it went into operation the next year in 1962 um, to focus particularly on Latin America, um, exclusively on Latin America and the Caribbean. And un unlike how the Free Trade Union Committee was being secretly funded by the CIA, AFIELD was being overtly funded by the U.S. Agency for International Development, USAID, which was a newly created agency by the Kennedy administration. Um, now, AFIELD was still very, very, very likely um, coordinating and working closely with the CIA, at least on a country by country basis. Um, uh, Rob McKenzie, I know is here and he, he's written a book called El Golpe that people should check out that talks a lot about the A-Fields connection to the CIA. Um, but the main funder was USAID. So I'll say more about what AFIELD was. AFIELD kind of became the, the primary Cold War weapon of the AFL-CIO for, for many, for about, for over 30 years, starting in 1961, 62. Here is a group. So what AFIELD was basically a, a labor education uh, program to bring trade unionists from Latin America to the United States um, for usually like a, a three months of uh, labor education and training, and I'll say a little bit more about what they were learning, um, and then going back to their home countries with funding from AFIELD to organize against any kind of left-wing or pro-Castro types of elements within Latin American labor movements. So here's a picture of AFL-CIO President George Meany with President John F. Kennedy in the White House Rose Garden with AFIELD trainees. This is actually the first class of AFIELD trainees. Um, here's another group of them. Now, AFIELD also had training programs within Latin American countries. That was where the bulk of these trainings happened. And then the most exceptional students, participants, would be selected to go to Washington um, for these three-month residential training programs, um, which would be a huge deal to them because these were working class guys um, who, you know, getting a, a, an all expense paid trip to the United States um, and, you know, meeting John F. Kennedy and things like that, and then going back home could be a really big experience in their lives. And they kind of often would then be very much loyal to the U.S. and to the AFL-CIO. And one of the most controversial things AFL did was on its board of directors, it welcomed in uh, businessmen with U.S. businessmen with interests in Latin America, including the CEOs of Anaconda Copper, the CEO of uh, Pan American Airways and others, as well as the, the CEO of W.R. Grace and Company, J. Peter Grace. The, the Grace Company is this huge conglomerate that 
had been active in Latin America for over a hundred years with shipping, with chemicals and agriculture and all kinds of things. And J. Peter Grace actually was the chairman of the board of Afield. Um, and this caused a lot of people to raise, you know, raise a lot of eyebrows. Why have these uh, corporate uh, executives who have a lot of uh, investments in Latin America and typically were very anti-union, why welcome them in on the board of trustees for this, uh, for Afield? If, you're, if the idea is to promote unionism, why have these anti-union corporate people on the board. Um, so here's some of the pictures of some of the cla A field classes in Washington, DC. And just to give you a sense, so like the classes covered things like collective bargaining and union administration, but a big part of the classes was how to combat left-wing influence within you know, your union when you go back to your home country in Latin America. In 1966, a writer for the Reader's Digest um, sat in on one of these classes and afterwards he wrote a little bit about it and he wrote about how there was like a role play where they did a, a scenario where uh, um, well here I'll just read it he says so he, he writes another session rehearsed a meeting of auto workers wherein red infiltrators were trying to divert matters to political ends and then these some sh planted hecklers shouted you are a puppet of Yankee imperialists trained in Washington. And they, they shout this at Juan, the Argentine chairman. And Juan shoots back, well, American workers are the highest paid in the world under the free enterprise system of class cooperation. And what did you communists learn in Cuba? How to reduce living standards by 15% in five years? How to destroy free unions with the government, uh, with government bosses and forced labor? Is that how you plan to emancipate the working class? If that's your, the, all, the best you have to offer, take your doctrines back to Moscow, or is it Beijing you're taking orders from this week? Um, so that's, that's the end of the scene there, but that was the kind of thing they were learning about. Um, and just to give one of many uh, examples of what, what happened after the AFIL trainees would go back to their home country. So Brazil, just as a quick case study, in 1961, Joao Goulart, uh, left-wing politician in Brazil, uh, leader of the Brazilian Labor Party, very popular with the working class of Brazil um, and friendly with the left and with commun the Brazilian Communist Party, became president of Brazil. And the Brazilian right was determined to get rid of him and Washington was also determined to get rid of him. They were uh, worried that he was going to allow Brazil to become another Cuba. And so right away, the uh, CIA and the State Department kind of got to work working with the Brazilian right and right wing military officials uh, in Brazil to, to oust him. And as that was being planned, um, Afield in Washington hosted a, a special class of all Brazilian trade unionists. Um, typically, Afield classes had you know a mix of people from different countries, but this was all Brazilians, 33 participants. And the course included 50 hours worth of instructions on how to combat communism uh, in your unions. And then one year later, um, Goulart was overthrown in a right-wing military coup. And you know, thousands of people were, uh, including trade unionists, were arrested, tortured, murdered by the coup regime. One of the things that the coup regime did very early on was send in uh, these people that they appointed called interveners to take over unions and purge them of any Gular sympathizers. And at least three or four of these interveners were actually graduates of this A-field class that happened in Washington. Um, and a couple months after the coup, uh, a high-ranking A-field official named Bill Doherty, uh, who, yeah, very important official in the in A-field, he was on a, doing a radio interview and he openly bragged about how uh, graduates, Brazilian graduates of Afield, quote, became intimately involved in some of the clandestine operations of the revolution before it took place. When he says revolution, he means the coup. And he continued, quote, what happened in Brazil did not just happen. It was planned months in advance. Many of the trade union leaders, some of them were actually trained in our institute were involved in the revolution and in the overthrow of the Goulart regime. 
Um, the Kennedy and Johnson administrations were very impressed by what Afield was doing um, and decided to replicate the Afield model in Africa and Asia by giving having USAID, US Agency for International Development, give the AFL-CIO millions more dollars to create similar institutes for Africa. That was the African American Labor Center founded in 1964. And in Asia, the Asian American Free Labor Institute founded in 1968. Basically just the same thing as AFIELD, but for these different regions. And in the late 60s, the, the, the big focus of the AFL-CIO, like the big focus of the US government in terms of foreign policy was Vietnam. And George Meany and other top AFL-CIO officials um, enthusiastically supported the war, right, because of their, their staunch anti-communism. And they backed the war even as the war became more and more unpopular at home. Although there were, and I'll say more about this in a minute, some unions and union leaders who were opposed to the Vietnam War wanting, wound up being a lot of divides. And as a result of all this attention around the war, uh, labor's foreign policy came under more and more scrutiny from the press. Um, so in terms of the AFL-CIO supporting the US war in Vietnam, it wasn't just sort of political support, but also actual on the ground support in South Vietnam with the AFL-CIO giving lots of money um, and advice to the Vietnam Confederation of Labor, which was the anti-communist pro-US labor federation in South Vietnam and its leader, its president, Tran Quoc Bu, uh, who was basically a kind of corrupt CIA linked union official. Um, so this is a picture of George Meany with Bu uh, in 1969. Here's also a picture of um, at a uh, Vietnamese Confederation of Labor affiliated uh, dock workers union uh, welcoming an AFL-CIO delegation in 1973. But one of the most sort of uh, notorious episodes regarding the labor movement and Viet Vietnam War happened in May of 1970 um, in New York City in lower Manhattan, actually on Wall Street. Uh, a group of college students and high school students were holding a anti-war protest. This was the same week that Nixon, President Richard Nixon announced uh, the US was invading Cambodia and actually expanding the war and the same week of the Kent State Massacre. So these students were protesting and then about 200 building trades workers, some of them who were actually working on the World Trade Center a few blocks away, came marching in with flags and actually attacked them, physically attacked the anti-war protesters, basically kind of saying, you know, if you're not patriotic, if you don't love this country, then get out of here. Now this wasn't spontaneous. This had actually been planned by uh, Peter Brennan who was the head of the New York Building and Construction Trades Council, um, which is part of the AFL-CIO and very much approved by George Meany and Jay Lovestone and folks like that. And Richard Nixon really loved this because he had been trying to court the working class vote, blue collar workers, union members. So when this happened, he invited Brennan and some of these other hard hats. This became known as the hard hat riot, right? As I'm sure a lot of you, most of you already know. Um, and uh, then Nixon made Brennan his secretary of labor in his, his second term. But a lot of this kind of got burned into the public's memory and this idea of associating the working class and unions with this very kind of conservative pro-Nixon attacking anti-war protesters kind of thing. Uh, and that kind of became the stereotype for a long time about, about you know, unions, especially building trades unions. But, you know, the reality was, very different. Like I said, a lot of unions were against the war from very early on. And uh, a majority of working class people were against the war because it was them or their, their sons or brothers who were being drafted and, and fighting and dying in the war. So one of the one of the unions that was very much anti-war consistently was Local 1199, which today is part of uh, SEIU, but back then it was part of RWDSU, um, a union in New York of Black and Puerto Rican women hospital workers, and you can see some of the pictures there of them protesting the war. And, um, and also a group of 
uh, sort of mid middle management type union officials and staffers called the National Labor Leadership Assembly for Peace gathered at the University of Chicago in Veterans Day weekend of 1967. Um, this includes Emil Macy, who you see there, who was the secretary treasurer of the UAW. Um, and Martin Luther King Jr. came and spoke at this, uh, this conference. And uh, this was the first time that some of the, the leftist unions that had been expelled from the CIO in 1949, 1950, uh, people from those unions like UE, like ILWU, uh, were there sharing the stage with the AFL-CIO affiliated union. So one of the first times uh, since those anti-communist purges that there was a little bit of a uh, more labor unity um, in protesting the war, speaking out against the war. Um, one of the uh, union officials who was very much against the Vietnam War was Victor Ruther. And this is actually a picture of him at an anti-war rally. Victor Ruther was Walter Ruther's younger brother. And uh, the UAW had its own international affairs department, and Victor Ruther was the director of that. He was sort of the main foreign policy guy for the UAW. And for years, he had been uh, seeing what the AFL-CIO was doing in foreign policy. He had seen what Afield was doing and complaining about it behind the scenes, thinking this is really bad. This makes us look really bad, and it's going to, uh, it's, it's not helpful for workers in the rest of the world. But he held his tongue. He didn't openly criticize this because he didn't want to sow labor disunity. He didn't want to, you know, potentially embarrass his brother Walter. But with the Vietnam War, he finally had enough. And in May of 1966, Victor Ruther gave an interview to the Los Angeles Times where he went on the record and said that the AFL-CIO had links to the CIA. Um, and this then opened up, uh, uh, well, it led to like kind of an explosion of journalistic exposés in 1967 where the New York Times and Washington Post and various other uh, news outlets started uh, you know, digging, doing some investigative journalism and finding out that the CIA had been sending money to those AFL-CIO affiliated unions that I mentioned, like AFSCME and the News Guild and others, um, for, since at least the late 1950s, using, uh, going through foundations, philanthropic foundations, some of these were real foundations, some of them were fake foundations that only existed on paper for the, as ways for the CIO to uh, you know, hide their tracks and, and give the money. So journalists started looking at those foundations and seeing how much money these unions got. And naturally the AFL-CIO completely denied all of this. Well, Victor Ruther, wound the ex sorry, the AFL-CIO Executive Council formally censured Victor Ruther for this uh, quote unquote campaign of vilification for they, they charged him with conduct un unbecoming a trade unionist by talking to the press and, and leaking these, uh, these CIA ties. Coming out of this, out of this period in the late 60s, and by the way, this is when people started using that derisive moniker AFL-CIA, uh, which you know, still sometimes people say that. Um, the AFL-CIO and AFIL didn't really learn anything from that. They didn't really change course after all those exposures. Um, and in the early 1970s, kind of did similar to what happened in Brazil, happened again in Chile when uh, Salvador Allende, socialist, Marxist, was democratically elected president, wanting to nationalize various industries, industries owned by U.S. corporations. Um, so right away, the Nixon administration was determined to get rid of him and to undermine his his government. And right around the same time that he became president, Afield really beefed up its involvement in Chile. Now, almost all of the Chilean labor movement was completely behind Allende. They supported him all the way. So instead of going through traditional unions, Afield was working with the sort of middle-class professional associations, like merchants associations and things like that, called gremios, which were more, much more conservative and anti-Allende including the like trucking gremios of like truck owners, truck operators, um, who in the late, late 1972 and throughout 1973 staged these crippling strikes, bringing the Chilean economy to a halt, leading to rapid inflation, 
all of that used as a pretext by the Chilean military, General Augusto Pinochet, to uh, initiate a coup uh, and overthrow Allende on September 11th, 1973. But what's important here, and this is what the, this photo is of, about a year later, um, a union activist, a plumber from the Bay Area, California, named Fred Hirsch, uh, published this pamphlet called uh, An Analysis of Our AFLCA Role in Latin America or Under the Covers with the CIA. There, he got a hold of various documents from Afield and the State Department and, uh, and published this pamphlet exposing how Afield had been involved in the coup, right? And, and the CIA, by the way, had you know, funded these, uh, funded the workers, the truckers who went on strike, you know, gave like $8 million to, to make sure that these strikes could happen. So, um, and so this pamphlet was widely circulated with the union rank and file in the US in the mid 1970s. And here's just a handful of like resolutions of th things from rank and file union members, particularly within the AFL-CIO protesting uh, what Afield had been doing. And uh, you, there's a resolution here from the Univer United Federation of Maryland Teachers calling for Afield to be dissolved. Uh, another group of rank and filers in San Francisco calling on uh, the, the AFL-CIO to, to break off this relationship with Washington of being funded, having foreign uh, policies be, or foreign activities being funded by the U.S. government. Uh, the Communications Workers of America sent this letter to Senator Frank Church, who was investigating the CIA, um, asking him to look into CIA, any CIA ties to the CWA, um, and so on and so forth. So this was all happening in the 70s and a lot of pushback, but still the AFL-CIO did not really change course uh, on its foreign policy. And then um, moving into the 80s, um, in Central America and Guatemala, El Salvador, especially on uh, Nicaragua, uh, left-wing revolutionary movements were, um, you know, fighting to get rid of the oligarchic military dictatorships in those countries. Um, and Reagan came in, Ronald Reagan came into office determined to crush those left-wing movements and really kind of stoke uh, the, the Cold War um, after, you know, after it had been somewhat quiet after the Vietnam War, he kind of wanted to revive it. And at this point, there was a new generation of AFL-CIO leaders like President Lane Kirkland, who, who succeeded Meany in 1979. Um, Kirkland, also an avid or avowed anti-communist, who uh, he was friends with Henry Kissinger. He had studied at Georgetown's School of Foreign Service. He was, seemed to be much more interested in foreign policy than in, than in domestic labor issues. And even as Kirkland and Reagan were kind of fighting with each other over labor issues at home, right? Reagan famously firing the 11,000 air traffic controllers who went on strike. Uh, he was, Kirkland was like working with the Reagan administration on foreign issue, foreign policy. Um, and AFIL became especially active in El Salvador as I, I know one of you, sorry, for, forgot your names, uh, someone in the audience mentioned earlier, um, trying to help the Salvadoran government basically lead this counterinsurgency campaign to crush the Salvadoran left, which was fighting for um, basic democracy and human rights, and many left-wing or progressive trade unionists in El Salvador being uh, targeted by death squads, being assassinated, tortured, or disappeared. And similarly in Nicaragua, where the, the, the left-wing Sandinistas had already won power, of course, Reagan was funding the, the Contras, the Contra revolutionaries and the CIA as well, training them, um, basically committing all kinds of atrocities to try to undermine the Sandinistas in Nicaragua. But a group of union presidents within the AFL-CIO, this is what's sort of different here about this time period, actually stood up and said, no, we're not going to, we don't want the AFL-CIO to be doing this stuff anymore, to be associated with, with this, especially after Vietnam. And so a group of union presidents in the AFL-CIO and then some of them eventually outside the AFL-CIO as well, 
created a new group called the National Labor Committee in Support of Democracy and Human Rights in El Salvador, or just National Labor Committee, or NLC for short. Um, and I'll just direct your attention first to the, the picture on the, on the right of the names. Um, so the, the, this National Labor Committee, the, the main leaders of it who started it were Jack Shankman, president of the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union, uh, William Winpissinger of the Machinists and Doug Frazier from the United Auto Workers. And then over time, more and more union presidents joined, joined it. And you can see uh, like Morty Barr from the CWA, uh, Kenneth Blaylock from the American Federation of Government Employees, Cesar Chavez, United Farm Workers, as well as you know, non-AFL-CIO union presidents, the president of the NEA, the ILWU, the UE, um, AFSCME president, Jerry McEntee, and importantly, SEIU president John Sweeney, who, you know, a few years later became president of the AFL-CIO after some of these same union presidents, among others, uh, kind of got tired of, uh, of Kirkland, uh, especially after NAFTA and, and pushed him out. But what the National Labor Committee was doing was sending delegations to Central America, to El Salvador, Nicaragua, and talking to some of the workers, the trade unionists who were being targeted by death squads and bringing a lot of attention to this and protesting Reagan's policy, even as the AFL-CIO was more or less on board with Reagan's foreign policy of trying to fund these right-wing governments uh, or funding the Contras. Um, in 19, April of 1987, the National Labor Committee, as well as I, I should say that it wasn't just the National Labor Committee of all these union presidents, all across the country, there were rank and file uh, committees uh, like you know, Central America Peace and Solidarity Committees in different cities and, and, and areas around the country of rank and filers. And they, they were basically on the same, more or less on the same page as the National Labor Committee, but kind of doing their own separate thing at the grassroots level. And in April of 1947, the National Labor Committee, all those grassroots rank and file committees, as well as a group of uh, faith-based organizations and religious groups, organized a big mobilization in Washington, D.C. to call for an end to military aid to the Salvadoran government, an end to all aid to the Contras, as well as, um, as, well as calling on the U.S. government and the Reagan administration to fight against apartheid in South Africa, to stop, you know, stop, doing tra stop trading with South Africa. Um, in the run-up to this big mobilization, like a few days before, Albert Shanker, who was the president of the AFT, American Federation of Teachers. Um, and Shanker, I need to say, was a very anti-communist guy, very much uh, close to Lane, K Lane Kirkland. Um, published this, he published this column in the New York Times, basically saying, you know, this, this big mobilization in Washington is coming up and a lot of union members are going to be involved in it. And he's saying, don't go because He's sort of insinuating here that you might be um, you might be getting involved with some leftists and communist people or pro-Soviet people or whatever. And so he's saying, my mother told me, you know, as a kid, don't hang out with the wrong crowd. It, they could lead you astray. And then immediately after this, like the next day, the executive director of AFSCME DC 37 in New York, Stanley Hill, published his own column pushing back and saying nobody's going to mislead anybody on this march. And he points to all the different unions that have been involved in organizing the march and saying they'll, they'll be walking away from the old ideas and feeble rhetoric that have served labor so poorly. And then he talks about how Shanker had said, you know, my mother warned me about hanging out with the wrong crowd. And Hill says, my mother warned me too. Her warning was uh, when the need is there, you can't hang back. So this rally happened. Um, in Washington, D.C. on the National Mall, uh, April 25th, 1987, an estimated 100,000 people were there. And of those, an estimated 30 to 40,000 people were union members. Um, and you can see some of them here, machinists. You see this guy on the right from the International Chemical Workers, Sal. Um, and so this was like a big break. And this was not sanctioned by the AFL-CIO leadership, not by... Lane Kirkland, but it was sanctioned by a majority of AFL-CIO affiliated union presidents, among other non-AFL-CIO unions like UE. Um, 
and was kind of an important rebuke. It said la organized labor is not going to support this kind of uh, these kind of proxy wars that are um, creating so much violence and oppression in Central America. Um, just by a way of conclusion, you know, all of this, uh, all of this uh, decades of, of interfering in other countries' labor movements obviously divided uh, and weakened labor movements around the world and also weakened or, or destroyed progressive left-wing political movements, all of which kind of helped it, as the Cold War came to an end uh, around between 1989 and 1991, um, allowed for the globalization and multinational corporations to more easily go into other countries and exploit workers, uh, to deregulate economies, to privatize, you know, industries, etc. And as far as, uh, well, you know, the, Washington was giving all those decades, millions and millions of dollars to the AFL-CIO to do all of this stuff. But workers in the U.S. didn't really seem to benefit from any of that, right? Um, the same government that was giving millions of dollars to the AFL-CIO to interfere in foreign labor movements, uh, supposedly in the name of free trade unionism, did little to promote union freedom at home, right? The, the Taft-Hartley Act was not repealed. Labor law wasn't reformed to make it easier for workers to join unions. The right to strike was not protected, and union jobs were not safeguarded from elimination, right? Even by the close of the Cold War, Washington was making it easier for corporations to exploit workers both at home and abroad by facilitating free trade agreements like NAFTA. Um, so that's where I'll stop. And I guess we can open it up to, I know I said a lot, I've been talking for a long time, so I'm gonna shut up for a minute and take a breath. Uh, thank you for listening.